bandwidth for changelog is provided by fastly learn more at fastly.com Welcome back, everyone. This is The Change Log, and I'm your host, Adam Stachowiak. This is episode 231, and today is a special episode recorded at Node Interactive 2016 in Austin, Texas. I talked with many of the speakers of the conference for an upcoming mini-series called The Future of Node, produced in partnership with the Node.js Foundation and sponsored by IBM. We'll be releasing those on our new show called Spotlight. So if you haven't subscribed to our master feed yet, which includes all of our podcasts, now would be a good time to do so. Head to your favorite podcast app, click search and search for Change Log Master and subscribe. But this episode, I talked with James Snow from IBM, the technical lead for Node. James is also a member of Node's technical steering committee, as well as the core technical committee. He's currently working on Node's implementation of HTTP2. I talked with James about the state of HTTP2, what this new spec has to offer, but more importantly, what the Node community can expect from this new protocol. We have three sponsors for the show today, Rollbar, GoCD, and Hacker Paradise. First sponsor of the show today is our friends at Rollbar. Put errors in their place with Rollbar. Easily get set up for your application. NPM install dash dash save. Rollbar, that'll get you set up with Rollbar's notifier. You also need an account, so go to rollbar.com slash changelog. Sign up, get the bootstrap plan for free for 90 days. With Rollbar's full stack error monitoring, you get the context, the insights, and the control you need to find and fix bugs faster. No more relying on users to report your errors, digging through log files to debug issues, or dealing with a million alerts in your inbox, ruining your day. Once again, rollbar.com slash changelog. Sign up, get the bootstrap plan for free for 90 days. And now onto the show. So what's the state of H2 in Node? I know you're working on it now. You've recently tweeted about a prototype server. So the, the current state is just trying to figure out how it would work in, in, in Node, right? It just, uh, there, there's a lot of new things within uh, H2. It's a brand new protocol, even though it's got the H- HTTP semantics with request, response, headers, and that kind of thing. Right. On the wire, it's it's very, very different. So it requires a, a completely new implementation. So kind of teasing the edges of what that implementation would need to look like, how it would work, what the issues are, um, what the, uh, you know, the additional state management, you know, what impact that's going to have on Node trying to figure out what those, um, um, you know, what that impact is going to be. And then if we were going to put it in core, if it's something that was going to land there, what would that look like in terms of APIs and in terms of uh, just kind of the performance profile and that kind of thing. So that's where we're at. We had a discussion earlier, Thomas Watson and Sam, I forget his last name from IBM. I'll Roberts, see yeah. Sam Roberts. Okay. Thank you for jogging my memory. And, uh, he wanted to talk. Sam was really passionate about talking about keeping Node small. Yeah. And Thomas actually coined, I don't know if it's him or not, but he tw- coined the term small core. Right. Uh, and so one of, the, one of the discussions we had in that conversation was what should or should not be in right. Node core. Right. And so as you're developing H2, you got to be thinking about H1 being there, whether it should stay there, if you did deprecate it, how you would do that. So right. end that argument between them, because they didn't really come to a conclusion of what should happen. What do you, th- do you think H2 should be a node core or should, be a, should it be a module? Um, personally, I think it should be in core. Uh, and the reason for that, node has always been a, a platform for the, for web development, right? You know, it's, uh, there's always been that web server and that is, it's, it, you true. know, it, it's a primary use case, even though there's so many different places node is being used in a different use cases. A live it, always goes back to having Node. And if you look, there is no standard library in Node, but there's HTTP, right? There's URL parsing. There's there's support for these fundamental web protocols that are built in, and that's the only thing that's built in, right? Now, if HTTP 1 wasn't already there, I wouldn't be thinking that we should add HTTP 2, right? There's you other- You think module at that point. Right, right. Okay. Uh, there are other protocols that are becoming increasingly more important to the web. WebSockets, for instance, right? We don't have WebSocket support in there, and we shouldn't have it, because it's not already there. Uh, Quick is another one. You know, it's a protocol that's you know starting to gain a lot of traction. You know, relative to t- t- you know, TCP/IP, it's got a long ways to go, but it's it's a it's a very good protocol. But 
you know, I, I wouldn't support any effort to actually get it into core unless it became much more fundamental to the, the, the web architecture, right? So with H2, the decision basically just comes to, we already have H1, right? We know H2 is going to continue in relevance, you know, grow in relevance. It is going to be, you know, you know we, we have a lot of people asking for it. It just makes a lot of sense to have it in, H, you know, in, 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 have it in core and have it available. So we also talked about, and maybe you can even end this argument too. We talked about how you define what should or shouldn't be in core, and it sounded like you said, maybe I'll answer this for you, and you can you can agree or disagree. But it sounded like you said around web fundamentals, like if it's fundamental to doing web stuff, it right. makes sense to put in core. But what what do you think about you know keeping Node Core small or what should how to define what should or shouldn't be in Node Core? Um, if it's not already there, then it shouldn't be there. It shouldn't be added. Right. Uh, yeah, another example of this was URL parsing. Right. You know, we have URL parse. Right. Uh, but it's fundamentally broken in a number of important ways. You know, it, it, it's there. It, you know, it, it fundamentally works. But there's a, 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 a quite a few use cases where URL parse just doesn't function correctly. So we added a new what WG URL parser. For, you know, it's the same. Um, uh, Parsing API that you use in the browser for you know new URL and you know, that kind of thing. So now we have two URL parsers in core, right? And there was a big debate whether that should just go out as a separate module or you know does it belong in core? And that question's still not completely settled. The only reason that would be added to core is because URL parsing is already in core, right? Right. And I think that is the the, the key distinction that you know we're not adding something that's brand new that doesn't already exist as part of the platform. We're just evolving what's already there, right? So that, that's, that, that, that's where I think we draw the line. So for those who may not be as familiar as you might be with Node Core, what exactly makes up Node Core to make you say, don't add more to it, just keep things in modules? So the, the basic um, protocol supports, you have DNS, you have you know, UDP, TCP, TLS, HTTP, right? These 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 fundamentals uh, of of just basic web application programming, right? That is what core is to me. Now there are things that are in support of that. You know, obviously we have to have you know a file system I/O, right? We have to have an inventing system, um, buffer, uh, right? For just basic data management, I view those as being more kind of um, utility capabilities, right? In support of the web platform uh, capabilities that are there. To me, that is a large part of what, what Node is. And if you look at all the different use cases where Node is being used, those are still the fundamental things that are being used the most, right? You know, even if you look at, at Electron, you know, it's, you know, it, it, those are basically web applications, right, that are bundled into a native app, right? Right. Um, yeah, it, it, you cannot get away from those fundamental pieces of that, of, of that basic protocol support. Uh, and that, to me, is what defines Node. It's so almost what you said, I said you said, but you said it. Yeah. Web fundamentals. Web, web if fundamentals, it, right. If it's around that, it belongs in core. Otherwise, right. Otherwise, you know, push module. it out to the ecosystem, yeah. So you're working on H2. Um, what's interesting about H2 for the Node community? Uh, that it's actually a very different protocol than H1. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, you know, it, it, it has the same name, but that, that too is, is really, really important. The fact that it uses a binary framing instead of a text framing, right? You know, and just line, line delimitation. Uh, stateful header compression is, you know, adds an interesting dimension of, uh, there's a whole lot more state management that has to occur over long lived uh, sockets that just doesn't exist currently in Node, and when you're when you're dealing with with, with uh, uh, you know with, with H1, uh, you know, and, and with the with the header compression and the multiplexing and stuff that the protocol enables, you can get much more efficient use of your connections. And when we start getting into the real world benchmarks of, uh, you know, like real applications rather than the peak load uh, type benchmarks I've been doing currently. I think we'll see much more efficient use of of, of Node and of the connection uh, uh, there, but it does require a different way of thinking about your web applications, your web APIs, because you're not just uh, pipelining individual requests one at a time. You can have, you know, I mean, you, the protocol provides no limit to the number of in-flight requests and responses you can have simultaneously over a single connection. Uh, and then you add things like uh, uh, push streams on top of that. It adds a, a, a significant new 
thing that you just have to consider of how you're building your applications and you know what the interaction is going to be with your you know in terms of performance and concurrency and and all these things that you just don't currently have to deal with. Um, so I think there's going to be a lot of just kind of coming to terms with the protocol and getting experience with the protocol and kind of figuring out what those best practices are because it's still a very young protocol you know and there's not a lot of industry best practice to draw from so you know mm -hmm. it's just kind of let's get it out there and get it in the hands of people to use and you know see how it evolves from there i talked to michael rogers earlier about kind of the state of the union so to speak for node.js and he was coming at it from a uh, direction and governance side, right. um, less of a code side. But one thing he said was a was a really important factor in this next year is security. Oh, yeah. And so, how does H two play into, or the work you're doing on H two, support the the overall mission of being more secure? Right. So th th there's th there's two things there. Um, with H1 in core right now, uh, a number of de design decisions were, were made early on to favor performance over spec compliance, right? Um, there, it turns out that there are a number of compliance things in the spec that says, you know, don't allow white space in headers, right? And there's very good reasons for that because you get into, you know, Quest, you know, smuggling and you know mm -hmm. response splitting and there's there's a lot of real specific security issues that come if you allow invalid characters into an H1 request. Node was like, yeah, we, you know, we want to we want things to go fast, so we're not going to check this, we're not going to check mm -hmm. that, and uh, it was a very deliberate um, uh, decision not to fully support uh, the H1 spec. Uh, and what we found is that that caused a number of security issues that we've had been dealing with, um, you know, uh, over the past year, two years, and stuff like that. Um, with H2, uh, we're, we're going to be taking an approach where we're going to be very spec compliant, right? And it's not, we're not favoring performance o over that. We're not sacrificing one of the other. Uh, it is going to be absolutely compliant to the specification without taking those kind of performance shortcuts. Uh, and that is something that I am emphasizing you know, in my own development as I'm going through this, that making sure that we can, uh, that we're hitting all of those, you know, you must do this or you must not do this that, that, are, that are fine in that specification. Um, and I think by adhering to the spec as closely as we possibly can, we mitigate a lot of those secu potential security issues. The other important thing is that even though H2 does not require um, TLS, uh, uh, you know, per the spec, you can do plain text if you want. The browser implementations, the primary clients uh, of H2 right now, uh, you know, Chrome, Firefox, and Safari, and some of the others, they require that the, they will only talk to a, a, a H, H2 server over TLS. Right, it's just mandated. They won't even connect to a plain text server. So, automatically out of the gate, um, you're 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 using con you know secured connections, uh, and I, and that alone is going to be a significant uh, improvement to security. The one kind of limiting factor there is Node hasn't really had a great reputation as a TLS terminator. You know, ter terminator. A lot of people is just as the best practice put a proxy in front of it, right? Mm -hmm. And then they'll reverse proxy back over a private, you know, over a, over a plain text connection back to Node and just to ensure the performance. A lot of that has to do with the way that the crypto works with the, with the event loop and open SSL and that kind of thing. So I think a lot of work is going to need to go in to try to improve that if we want to improve the performance of Node as a TLS endpoint and, and, and make that story, you know, improve on that story, so. What, uh, what gets you most excited about H2 being available. I know you're working on things like you talked about the state of things, but what's the most exciting to you that's going to change things for it? Just, just seeing the the, the the getting it into the hands of developers and seeing what they do with it, right? Uh, it, it is a very young protocol, all right? It is brand new, and I and I have my issues with it. I was actually involved with you know the working group for a while that was actually creating it, and I was one of the co-editors on the draft. So it was early on, you know, you know, had you know some interest in, in where it could go. Uh, then I got out of it for a little while. I had some issues with how it was designed, and I'm not completely happy with the protocol by you know, by, by any stretch. I, I do have my issues with it, um, but I want to see what developers do with it, right? And I, I love seeing all the different ways that people are using Node today in, in ways that we didn't even imagine that you know that, that they could or would or anything else. 
And I want to see that also with the protocol, just the, the, the experimentation and just the, the, all the different new types of applications that, that could be used, you know, you know, that could be developed, or all the w- different ways that it, um, that it could be innovated on and built on. Any and, ideas? And, and, any, any pontification you could do uh, you know, on what there, could be built? There, there, there are all kinds of uh, opportunities for more interesting RESTful APIs. You know, push streams... It, it, Push streams are, are, some, are something that are, are, are really interesting, and so far they've only been, really been looked at as a way of pre-populating a request cache, right? You know, I'm going to push it out so you don't have to have to do it. But I think with REST APIs, push streams offer some really interesting opportunities for new kinds of APIs that are, are providing, you know, event notifications or, you know, the server's more proactively pushing um, um, uh, data to, to the client. One... Um, one person I was talking to, in, in one of the ways that they were kind of prototyping stuff and you know using H2, uh, is they have uh, they, they would create a, a tunnel using over an H2 connection where they would you know open the connection with their client, but then once the connection was established, they would switch roles, right, and allow the server to, to act as the client, you know, to the server, you know, to the you know, and the client was acting as the server, and they were doing this as a way of of doing uh, uh, testing uh, over a uh, uh, over their network environment. Um, that kind of thing you can't do that with H1, right? But because of the you know the, the multiplexing and the and you know and the, the communication model that exists in, in, in H2, that kind of stuff is is allowed, right? It's something you can do. Um, H2 is going to enable uh, new extensibility models, kind of new possibilities for new kinds of protocols that kind of coexist with uh, the HTTP semantics. And we already see some of that work already happening within the working group. There's, there's proposals for other kinds of protocols that are layered into the mix. Um, and, you know, if we you know, kind of wonder, well, you know, who would do that kind of thing? Well, look at WebSockets, right? Look how WebSockets emerged and, you know, its relationship with H1 and kind of the difficulties that, that existed trying to get those two things to work together, right? With this, the framing model is going to allow you to more naturally experiment with those kinds of new protocols without the the pain that we had with, you know, trying to introduce WebSockets into it. So there's, there's a lot of new types of innovations, I think, that, that could come out of it, but we need to build a kind of a collective experience working with it in order to be able to tease those things out. We're going to push pause for just a moment and hear a word from one of our sponsors. If you normally fast forward through our ads, don't do it for this one. This one's pretty important to us. We're teaming up with Hacker Paradise to offer two open source fellowships for a month on one of their upcoming trips to either Argentina or Peru. So if you're a maintainer or a core contributor or someone looking to dive deeper into open source and you want to take a month off from work to focus solely on open source, this is for you. For those unfamiliar with Hacker Paradise, they organize trips around the world for developers, designers, entrepreneurs, and trips consist of 25 to 30 people who want to travel while working remotely or hacking on their side project. It's a great way to get out, see the world, spend an extended period abroad, and fellowship recipients will receive one month on the program working full-time on open source, free accommodations, workspace, events, and even a living stipend. And one thing we're pretty excited about with this is we'll be following along. We're going to produce a couple of podcasts to help tell the story of those recipients who go on this fellowship, the hacker story, the open source story. It's going to be a lot of fun. To apply, head to hackerparadise.org slash changedog. You'll see a blog post explaining what this is all about, what the open source fellowship is. And down at the bottom of the post, you'll have an opportunity to apply. If you have any questions about this whatsoever, email me, adam at changelog.com. You mentioned some uh, some things you're not happy with with the H2 protocol. I couldn't let you not tell me what those are. So what are, what are the what are the gotchas? What are the things that are just bugging you about this protocol? Um, uh, it's stateful header compression. Um, it, it, it's very effective, right? You get some, you know, in terms of headers in HP are very repetitive. You know, you know, you're sending the same data over and over and over again, you know, cookies or, you know, um, user agent strings, you know, all these kinds of things. And when it, ter- when it comes to actually what's transmitted over the wire, it's a lot of waste, like a date, right? right. And, and H1 is 29 bytes because it's encoded as a string. You know, that can be like more compactly encoded as just a, a couple of bytes if you're using a, a, a more efficient encoding, right? Um, so it's very, very wasteful as it exists today. 
um, HPAC, which is the, the state for header compression protocol in H2, uses this state table that's ma maintained at both ends. There's actually two in each direction. So the sender has two, the receiver has, has two. Uh, and it, you know, the, the receiver gets to say how much state is actually stored. The sender gets to say what's actually stored in, in, in that table. But for the, the entire life of the connection of that socket, however long that socket is kept open, you have to maintain the state, right? And that doesn't exist in H1 today. H1 is a completely stateless protocol. So H2 com switches that and makes it where you have to maintain state. You have wow. to maintain this server affinity, right, over a long-lived connection. Uh, and even though you're multiplexing multiple requests in flight at the same time, you have to uh, uh, process those headers sequentially uh, uh, and, and serialize the access to those, to those things. Uh, because if that state table gets out of sync at any point, you just tear down the connection. It's just you, you can't do anything else uh, on it. Uh, and even even over multiplex uh, requests, you, ha you you know all of those requests and responses share the same state tables. <laughs> so it, it adds an additional layer of complexity that just didn't exist Wasn't previously. There before. And personally, I don't think it was it was needed. Right? I think that there were Things other done ways. Differently. Um, I, I actually, you know, like I said, I, I worked on the, the, the spec, you right. know, I was one of the co-authors, and, and I, I had a proposal for just using a, a more efficient binary encoding, um, uh, uh, you know, of certain headers, like dates, right, or uh, instead of, you know, representing numbers as text, rep, rep, representing them, you know, is, is just is, is binary, right? Um, uh, the compression ratios weren't as good, but you could transmit that data without incurring the cost of managing the state, right? So it'd be just like what H1 has today, where you're still sending it every every time, but you're sending less right. every, every time. Um, Makes and, sense to shrink it rather than... Right. Shrink it, yeah, then, rather then adding than, the state. I, I kind of agree with you on the state, because it seems like it's adding this extra layer of, like... Right. It's it's almost like somebody shakes your hand and doesn't let it go. Uh, well, yeah, and in, in a lot of ways, that's exactly what it is. Now, Google has ton of experience with speedy right and you know a lot of what, what's in HP2 came out of the experience you know came out of the work that Google did on, on speedy and I have a, a huge amount of respect for, for everything that they, they did and they provided HPAC also came out of out of Google so they did a ton of research in terms of what would work right and they had concluded that stateful header compression was the only way to get the you know the, like real benefits out of H2 you know, I, I disagreed with some of those conclusions, but you know, the the working group decided, you know what, this is what we're going to move forward with, and that's that's what they did. And at this point, it's like I don't like it, <laughs> but you but know, you gotta, you gotta deal that's with what it. it is, and you know, that's what we're what we're moving forward on. Um, some of the other things there, the the in terms of like additional complexity, is H two has its own flow control, has its own prioritization. You can have streams depend on other streams, and when you set the priority on one, it you know, sets the priority for the entire graph. You know, it's, you know, there's, there's just a lot there that just doesn't exist in H1, right? That, you know, how much of that do we expose to developers, right? Like, in, you know, in Node, we have right. to provide an API for all this stuff. Do we provide an API for flow control? That doesn't exist in Node currently, right? right. I mean, how would we even do that in a way that's efficient? Uh, about prioritization, how do we, you know, what kind of APIs do we do there? This additional complexity is something that, that as you know, in Node Core, looking at this, we have to decide how much of that do we pass on to the user versus how much of that do we do ourselves. If we do it all ourselves, we're providing fewer knobs for you know you, the users to turn to to tune things, and we're making it less interesting for them because we're hiding some yeah. of those features, we're hiding those capabilities, and, and, and is that the right thing to do? Right. So the additional complexity kind of you know. It's it's not something we can easily deal with. It's something we ha we have to kind of. It's like, right there in your face. You right there in your face. About it. You have to do something about it. Yeah, so. So. Stateless compression. That's one thing. Um, maybe give me the flip side of that. Like, what's? I guess you've already kind of described it to a to a bit with with the complexity, but. What are, what's the worst that could happen? The, the, the server affinity issue is, is actually the biggest, the biggest issue here. Um, 
a, a lot of the the proxy um, software vendors had some real significant problems with H2 as it was being defined, and uh, you had a lot of criticism um, being you know, put forth. The the I, I can't remember his name, but the author of uh, I believe it's the Varnish proxy is, is okay. very That's public yeah. um, in his discontent with the protocol. Um, because of the binary framing and the way the headers are, are actually, you know, um, transmitted, right? You can't do what a lot of the proxies do currently, which is just kind of read the first few lines, determine, you know, where you're going to route that thing to, then stop and just forward it on, right? Uh, which is super efficient way of doing it. You have to process the entire block of headers, Right, then make the determination of whether you're going to do anything with it or not. At that point, you basically have to terminate that connection and open another connection, you know, to your back end. Mm. And you have so that proxy is actually having four four state tables for compression and a lot more uh, stuff that they're having to do that that existing proxy uh, uh, middleware currently doesn't have to do. Right, right. So. You know, I you can see why you're against it. Up. Well, you know, it, it's it's. They could uh, just go the other way, which just just shrunk it instead of. It, well, it's the same it, thing it, back it, and forth, but just shrink right. it. it. It it added you know it, it added a lot of complexity. Now, you know, what it, are the plus sides of this complexity? That like you're you're talking about the bad side, but what's the performance? Performance, performance. using that uh, that socket much more efficiently. Uh, you know, I was doing a peak load uh, benchmark here the other the other day with with you know just the development image of, uh, of H2 and core. Uh, I was serving 100,000 requests at the, ser at the server. Uh, it was 50 concurrent clients um, and going over eight, eight threads, right? So just as much, just throw a bunch of stuff at the server and see what happens, right? And see how quickly it can respond. With the H1 implementation in, in core currently, I was able to get 21,000 uh, requests per second doing that. But 15% of them just failed, right? Where no, just didn't respond, right? Uh, and a lot of that has to do with, I, mean, I was running a test on OSX, there's some issues there with uh, assigning threads, you know, how quickly you can assign threads, and, you know, when we get an extreme high load, there, you can run into some issues. With H2, I was able to get 18,000 requests per second, so fewer transaction rate, but 100% of them succeeded. Wow. Right? Uh, and it was using uh, uh, fewer sockets, now it was keeping them open longer. The, tra the downside of that was it was using a significantly more memory. Right, but it had a a, a, um, a better success rate, right, and it was using the the, the, the bandwidth um, uh, much more efficiently, and uh, the the header compression, for example, uh, we were able to save 96 percent of the header bytes, you know, compared to uh, H1, right. So you know, or actually, it's 96 percent fewer header bytes sent over the wire over to you know with with 100,000 requests. That's a massive savings. Right, and yeah. if we're, for you know, for looking at you know the, the platform as a service where people are paying for bandwidth, and they're you know paying for this stuff, saving that much is is significant. A lot of money. Right. They'll spend that money in memory, though. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They'll make up for it in other ways, uh, and you know y y that. Increase in performance is significant. You can't discount it. There is a, uh, um, uh, with the fact that TLS is, is is there, it's required. There is an improvement in security, but there are definite trade-offs. And uh, anyone looking to adopt H2 has to be aware of what those trade-offs are. Um, and it's something that is, is as we're going through in core, trying to figure this thing out. There's also going to be trade-offs in terms of API, right? Um, and in one you know, like simple example is the fact that the status message in H1, you know, you have like the, the, the preamble on a response, mm -hmm. is HP, you know, 11, 200, okay. That okay doesn't exist in H2. They completely remove the status message, right? So no more 404 not found, it's just 404, right? No more 500 server error, there's no server error, <laughs> right? There is no standard way. Just the number. To, yeah. There's no standard way of conveying the status message. They just completely removed it from the protocol. Well, there are existing applications out there that use the status message, right? And actually put content there that the clients read. Now, it's not recommended, right? And, it's in, in, in H1 spec, you know, doesn't assign any semantics, reliable semantics, that anyone should use to, you know, like, say, hey, that's a, that's a thing we should use. 
but as users do, they'll they'll use whatever's available to them. That's right? a bummer because it, it, people will stop saying 200 OK now. They'll just say 200. They'll say 200. Right. <laughs> right. The 404 not found. The whole jokes. You know. Right. 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 Nobody will get it anymore. Um, so if you look at if you look at Node's API and or things like Express, you know they have like you know here's how you set the status message. Well. That's a breaking change in those APIs when you go to H2. So we have to make a decision of how closely does the H2 API have to match the H1 API and act the same way when we know that there are distinct differences that mean it, it can't. Mm. So it makes upgrading or changing to H2 a very deliberate choice. Yeah, you, yeah, it's going to have to be very deliberate. And, and, and it's only going to be in very simple, simple scenarios, which probably aren't realistic, that somebody would be able to say, okay, it works in both, right? It, it's going to be a thing where you have to design your application specifically for H2 uh, in order to take advantage of the, uh, the kind capabilities. It's kind of putting a high barrier in front of it, too. I mean, exactly. It, I mean, you can't expect adoption of what is, as you said, a better performing protocol if you put a mountain in front of it. All right, right. No one's going to no one's going to want to climb that. Well, you know, or, or it's less it's, enjoyable it's, it's less, or less yeah. likely right, or right. whatever. We have, people do it. We have lots of people that say they really want this. They really want H2 and they want to uh, and we have a lot of people that are that are talking about it not necessarily for uh, user facing, right? You know, put setting up websites that you know anyone on the internet can access. They want to put it in their data center and have, you know, uh, a server to server communication be much more efficient, yeah. which is a huge use case for for Absolutely. H2. And especially if, since that is, you know, you know, you know, within protected environments and you, you have more control over what the client and a server, there's opportunities there where you don't have to necessarily worry about t the TLS. You can do a plain text connection and you'll get far greater uh, performance out of it. But it, again, it has to be a very deliberate choice. All right. Last pause of the show to hear a word from one of our sponsors. Our friends at ThoughtWorks have an awesome open source project to share with you. GoCD is an on-premise, open source, continuous delivery server that lets you automate and streamline your build test release cycle for reliable continuous delivery. With GoCD's comprehensive pipeline modeling, you can model complex workflows for your team with ease, and the value stream app lets you track a change from commit to deploy at a glance. The real power is in the visibility it provides over your end-to-end -end workflow so you can get complete control of and visibility into your deployments across multiple teams. To learn more about GoCD, visit go.cd slash changelog for a free download. It is open source. Commercial support is also available and enterprise add-ons as well, including disaster recovery. Once again, go.cd slash changelog. And now back to the show. So H2, is this something that you're solely working on or do you have a team working on it with you? Um, uh, right now, it's been primarily myself. I'm working on, you know, kind of growing that team of, of contributors. Is it an, I, an IBM or is it open source contributors? Uh, it's, it's open source. I'm okay. doing everything out in the open, out on the, uh, uh, the, the, the is node. Is it on your user GitHub then? Uh, it's on, we're doing it in the, under the node uh, organization. Okay. Uh, so if you go uh, github.com node.js slash HTTP2. Yeah. Um, everything, all the work's being done there. I saw that repo there, but I saw like Ryan Dahl in there. So this is not a new repo? No, this it's, isn't... so it, it, it's a, it's a clone of the node core. Okay. Right. So okay. the, even though, I the, understand. even though the decision hasn't been made to get it into core yet. Right. You're um, assuming it is. Assuming yes. it is and developing it this. I'm but following you now. I was wondering why I was like, <laughs> I expected it to be a module when I was, but then again. Well, it's being implemented in such a way that it, we could easily extract it out as a native module if we needed to, if that decision was made. Right. Um, it doesn't, I think, well, I can't say it doesn't use With any. With all this change, wouldn't it make sense just to cut the cord? And, you know, one thing Thomas and Sam were talking about was verbally and documentation-wise deprecated. Don't do anything to the, to the way it responds or, right. you know, using anything within the core. Why not just verbally deprecate it and then... It's way too early for us to do that. H2 is a... V very immature protocol, right? Um, it, it still has to be proven, and the vast majority of the web is still driven by H1. Uh, going out there and saying that, okay, we're going to deprecate this when an H2 has not yet been proven right? Um, would be you know, very you know, premature. So what do you do then? You just offer both? Both, yeah. yeah. And just say that you know, Node is going to be a platform for HTTP, HTTP development, right. one and two. 
right? And there will be mechanisms that's built into the spec you know, HD specification that, that you could actually run H1 and H2 on the same port. You know, you can have a server that that will offer both, and the client negotiates which one they want to use per socket. Uh, we're not quite there yet in terms of how we're going to figure right. out how to make that work in, in Node, but you know that, that's a key capability of uh, of H2. Uh, so if we are going to fully implement that spec, that means also implementing that upgrade path, which means we can't necessarily get rid of of, mm -hmm. of H1. Yeah. Uh, and the fact of the matter is, we can't get rid of anything in core, right? right? I mean, you see that, you know, in things like the the recent buffer discussions, whether we deprecate, you know, things. We just we can't get rid of things that are that are so critical to what the Node ecosystem is doing um, that even having a deprecation message in there that is problematic. Yeah. Uh, and something so fundamental as H1, um, I don't think we would ever get to a point where we would fully, fully deprecate. deprecate. Yeah, I'll I'll retract that deprecation statement and, and say it more like uh, instead uh, because when we were having that discussion about the options of deprecating things was not to put it in where it was a response, but more so in like documentation where it was right. frowned upon. Right. You know, it wasn't forced. And then uh, you're obviously so much more closer. So I'm just outside of looking in, but I'm thinking like, if it's so deliberate to choose it, wouldn't it make sense or potentially make sense? And this will be a decision you all eventually make to offer it as a module instead. That way you can have a clean break when it is time to right. move over. I'm just thinking if it's that deliberate, why not make it that deliberate where it's actually required? Well, I mean, it's it, it's a legitimate, you know, it's, it's a legitimate question. And that's actually one of the, dis the the decisions that the CTC has to make. You know, from, from you know, I have an opinion on it, but, um, you know, it, 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 unfortunately, it's not just all up to me, <laughs> right? We have right. to listen to the, you know, you know, folks like Sam and Thomas and, and the ecosystem and figure out what is the right approach to take. Um, and we're not close enough yet to reaching that decision, right? So um, I'm being very deliberate in how I write this code to ensure that if we need to pull it out, if that ends up being the, the you know, the right thing to do, we can. Um, uh, you know, it's not making breaking changes to any existing part of Node. Uh, it is a, a, a very distinct separate code path from the existing H1 stuff. Uh, you know, it, it would be a native module, you know, and all the things that come along with native modules, you know, so we'd have, you know, there would be some considerations there. Right. But um, if we needed to, we could. Uh, and, and, you know, like I said, I have my opinion of, on what it ultimately should do, but it's up to the community. It's up to the, you know, the core team to make that decision uh, for whatever reasons they want to make that decision. So. Cool. Let's close with, um, with any closing thoughts you might have. On this subject, anything I might not have asked you that you're like, I gotta put this out there before we close down. <laughs> oh, we you know we've we've, we've really covered a, you know a lot of it. I mean, the, kind of the big thing I would say is um, you know you know if, if the folks are, are really passionate about this, we need to hear from users. We need to hear from folks that you know that 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 you know have ideas on how to implement it, right? And or how to how to test or what kind of applications they they, they want to build with this thing. Um, I've had a lot of conversations so far, but you know it, it's it's a big ecosystem. There's a lot of people out there, right? right. Um, you know, so you know we can't have enough uh, uh, input uh, on on that direction. That information, that input, is what's going to help drive that decision of of. Uh, of what's going to happen with this with this code, right? Um, what's the best way for people to reach out to you then? Like, if if it's feedback you want, is it you personally? Is it should they go to the repo? I go, to the, go to the repo. Go to the repo. Open issues. You know, the, for, okay. for the folks that really want to like you know get in there. You know, cool. pull requests are, are great. Um, I've been making. There's been a lot of churn in the code. I've been getting in there and just like you know hammering away at it for the past few weeks. And people are asking, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> people have been asking. You know, it's like, well, where the to do so we know where to jump in. It's like, well. Well, you know, I, don't I don't even know what the heck I'm going to do tomorrow, let alone what to recommend you jump in on. But, you know, it, it's it's starting to stabilize right. more. And there are very distinct areas that I know for sure, you know, tests, performance benchmarks, you know, um, those kinds of things right. that, you know, we absolutely could use some, 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 some help on. Um, so anyone that wants to jump in, just you can go to that repo, take Testing, a look at what's happening. things like that. Right. Okay. So. We'll link up the the, uh, the repo in the show notes for this. And James, thanks so much for uh, we're closing down, literally closing down uh, Node Interactive. Oh, yeah. uh, so thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. Oh, it yeah, is important absolutely. that we have this conversation. So I know that the 
the the no community is going to appreciate what you have to say. Right on. So, right. Yeah. Thanks, man. Thanks. I want to give one more shout out to our friends at Node.js Foundation for collaborating with us on this project and also to our friends at IBM for sponsoring the Future of Node series. To get notified when we launch the full series, subscribe to Changelog Weekly at changelog.com weekly. Everything we do gets announced in that email. And thanks for listening.